Okay, chapter 15. Look at this. We're almost to the end of the book. The hut was gone, and Nim was too tired to start looking for what was left of it. The last of the storm clouds disappeared from the sky. The sun sank golden low, and Nim and Alex were still laying on the beach talking. Selkie slipped back into the water to fish for her supper. Fred found some seaweed left on the beach by angry waves. Chica gave them a long look and dragged herself toward the water. Nim hugged her as tight as a huge, as you can hug a large green turtle. Goodbye till next year, she said. Thank you for rescuing me, Alex said, and kissed the top of Chica's wrinkled head. Chica looked up to her up at her and blinked. It was hard to tell what Chica was thinking. We need to go to the emergency cave before the sun goes down, Nim said. And she had a feeling that Alex mightn't be very good at rock climbing in the dark. We can have an emergency can for dinner. And a coconut from the raft? I wonder where the other raft went, said Nim. But she was wondering even more where Jack was. The other raft had been tossed out of Keyhole Cave when the sea went crazy. But it had bounced clear of the swirling reef waters and had been caught by the monster waves raging out to the west. And it was grabbed by an exhausted man with a scar on his forehead and a two-week-old beard. Alex wasn't any better at rock climbing than Nim had thought she'd be, but man, she loved the cave. Like Alibaba, she exclaimed. I cleaned the hut so nicely, Nim said gloomily, and I even made you a new sleeping mat. Alex hugged her. It wasn't quite the same as hugging Jack, and not quite the same as snuggling into Selkie, but it made her believe that the world might get better again. Nim woke to see Alex at the door of the cave, watching the sun rise over Fire Mountain. And look at the sea, said Alex. The waves rolled gently, washed clean and blue. Birds soared and swooped, screeched and fished. Iguanas and lizards scrabbled and sea lions lazed and their king's hawk echoed across the water. Selkie Selfie waffled good morning, but when Nim had hugged her and rubbed noses, Selkie slid down the rocks and a moment later her brown head popped up at Sea Lion Point beside the kings. Fred grazed for seaweed in the tidal pools. He didn't quite trust the ocean yet. Nim and Alex had a coconut and an emergency rice pudding for breakfast, set up the satellite dish and the solar panel on a flat rock above the cave. They plugged the computer and phone into charge and then went out to explore. They went to Turtle Beach, Sea Lion Point, the Hissing Stones, and Keyhole Cave, where it all began, said Alex, because if I hadn't done the experiment, I wouldn't have been able to write back again. And you would have never come. Already that seemed impossible. They went on exploring. Nim's beautiful island was shredded with messy and messy with bits of hut, pieces of shirts and desk, coconuts, palm branches, broken trees, and lying down bushes. As if the, a giant had had a time. Excuse me. It's as if a giant had a tantrum, Alex exclaimed. The garden was worse. It looked as if Selkie had taken her sea lion family up for a party. Pea plants were mashed, avocados were mushed, and tomatoes were soup. Some plants had so few leaves it was hard to remember what they used to be. The garden shed with the bananas still on their hook had been lifted right up over the wall and dropped neatly in the middle of a bamboo grove. Nim and Alex collected three green pineapples, a few mashed strawberries, and some scattered pea pods. They hauled broken bits out of the pool and into the compost heap and saved two avocados, a tomato, and ten more strawberries. And the sweet potatoes will be safe, Nim said, when we feel like digging them. They chucked broken plants off the garden and propped up the living ones. And when they were worn out, Nim taught Alex how to slide down the waterfall and into the pool. And then Alex told her stories till they were ready to work again. She told more stories that night while they tried to sleep on the hard cave floor. The stories were funny and they made Nim laugh. Exciting, so she had to hold her breath. And something else that made her feel soft and warm and happy sad. So 
that she wanted to hug Selkie. Except Selkie had decided it was too hard to go all the way up to the cave for the night, and she was sleeping with the sea lions. The next day, they started clearing the grasslands and the beaches, dragging band branches into piles for bonfires and coconuts into heaps for eating, sorting out anything else that might have come from the hut or could be useful to build a new one. And all the time that they heaved and carried and sorted, Nim worried about when Jack would get home and when Alex would leave. She hated the stories Alex told her about home in the city because she wanted to pretend that Alex would stay on the island forever and ever. They took a different path to the garden and found Nim's favorite glass bottle, her comb, a good piece of rope under a dead jellyfish, and her wagon hooked on a branch at the top of a tree. The tree wasn't hard to climb, but it was a long stretch from the last safe branch, and when the wagon tumbled to the ground, so did Nim. The scab ripped off her knee and she began to bleed again. Nim didn't cry, but Alex did. Oh, I had bandages and cream and a whole first aid box for you, she sobbed. But she helped Nim clean the sand out with fresh coconut juice. And then Fred hinted that they ought to eat the coconut now that they'd opened it. So they had it for lunch with bananas. And since they were at the pool and had a comb, they washed their hair and combed out two days of tangles, which hurt more than the skinned knee. Alex looked so pretty, tugging the knots out of her long golden hair, and she was still so sad about Nim's knee. Wait here, Nim ordered and ran all the way to the cave and back again without even stopping to look out at the sea. Close your eyes, she said, dropping the coconut pearl into Alex's hand. I was going to give it to you if you went away, but it seems like you need it now. Oh, Nim, said Alex, I can't take this. I had it in front of a, my mother's picture, Nim said. But a picture really can't see it, so I want you to have it. I want to share this picture with you really quick. Here's Alex and Nim, and they're looking at the bottom of the tree. There's Nim's wagon up there. And Nim climbed all the way up there, got the wagon down. And this looks like the branch that Nim probably fell from because it was the closest one to the ground. Alex had gotten soggy again. I mean, she like started to cry. If I could have a daughter, she said, when she could talk again, I'd want her to be exactly like you. Suddenly, the honking from the sea lions was too loud to hear anything else. Nim flew down the hill as Selkie led the whole herd into the water, splashing, barking at a strange shape drifting in through the reef. And Jack staggered off the bag of coconuts and waded onto the sand. Then he and Nim did a wild, what? laughing, hugging dance, but Jack went pale as he stared at where the hut used to be. The science stuff is safe, Nim said, but her father didn't seem to care as much as she thought he would. I'm never leaving you alone, uh, and then he stopped and he couldn't say anything more. Alex was coming down the hill. Um, Dad, there's something I've got to tell you, said Nim. That's the end of chapter four.